but that was actually a way of also creating ties with the South, um, intellectual relationships with the South. And so his writings as a historian also allowed him to create intellectual connections to these very important regions. Um, and, and regions that remained important in the financing of higher education long after slavery ends in the Northeast. What about Yale University? Yale actually is a very similar story. You know, in 1701, when the original founders are actually meeting to establish the, what was in the collegiate school, um, they, as one of their um, chroniclers puts it, they come from the various towns to meet up, um, and they're followed by their men servants or their slaves. Um, the, slave, the enslaved people are actually at the founding of the institution. Um, and once it's established, like most of the 18th century colleges, and especially by the 18th century as the slave trade peaks, um, the new business of higher education, the financial model for a successful college, requires, in fact, tapping into these new sources of wealth in the Americas. And that means the slave trade and the plantations of the South and the West Indies. Did anyone at these universities, and I think you talk about it, Yale, mm -hmm. say no to slaves? Yes. Yes. You know, there's, at every moment that there's a push towards slavery, there's also anti-slavery. There's an anti-slavery tradition actually emerging um, in, from the 17th century right through the 18th century. And much of it, because it's an intellectual movement, because it's a moral and religious movement, is actually housed on campus. And you, so you have this tension on campus, and I try and actually point that out at various times in the book. Um, one of the examples that I use actually relates to the image that you showed of the presidents, and particularly Quincy. Um, under Quincy's administration, um, Charles Fallon, the German uh, historian, the, I'm sorry, the German professor at um, Harvard, uh, who was a rebel of the, um, uh, in Germany and who was chased out for his radicalism, comes to the United States, gets appointed professor of German at Harvard, and then is immediately attracted to the abolitionist movement. Fallon is actually punished for that decision. Um, he eventually loses his professorship, and when you trace the origins of the professorship, the funding had largely come from families with ties to the slave trade and slavery. I mean, that's yeah. very interesting what you point out at places like Harvard, yeah. is that a lot of the endowments for the professor chairs yeah. come from s yeah. the slave trade. Yeah, the first, actually the very first um, endowed professorship at Yale the Livingston Professor of Divinity actually comes from the Livingston family of New York and New Jersey. Um, and it's the second generation Philip Livingston gives it in um, basically recognition of the fine education that his sons had received at Yale. Um, and Livingston is one of the, uh, the Livingstons are one of the larger slave trading families out of New York City. The rivals for places like Newport, Rhode Island, and, and Providence, which